This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Nathaniel Fick, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for New American Security. Prior to joining the Center, the Center Fick served as a Marine Corps Infantry Officer. He took part in the earliest phases of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan and Pakistan in 201 and 202, and led a reconnaissance unit during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. He is the author of the 205 New York Times bestseller, One Bullet Away. Nathaniel, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. I'm happy to be here. Uh, where were you born and raised? Born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Completely, uh, as I suspect is true for many kids. Uh, my father had joined the Army in the 1960s um, for a brief stint. Uh, my mom's a social worker by, by training, and uh, I think they instilled in uh, me and my two sisters a commitment to the community beyond our, our home, uh, to public service. Uh, and so I was looking when I was in college for a way to go down that path. And, and I believe you uh, said in your lecture that your uh, grandfather served in the military. He did, yeah. My, my grandfather was a naval officer in World War II, and he served aboard uh, one of the escort aircraft carriers, the Jeep carriers, they called them, the small aircraft carriers, uh, the USS Natoma Bay. Uh, and he was wounded, actually, in June of 1945 by a Japanese kamikaze uh, when the plane hit his ship in the explosion. Uh, he was hit with a piece of shrapnel, but he survived the war. And, and uh, he actually left uh, Yale, uh, he was a student at Yale to enlist. And then tell us the story mm -hmm. about the, the medal that you carried with you or the... the yeah, he, yeah. He, uh, he left Yale in 1942 uh, after Pearl Harbor and he'd been in the class of 1945 uh, and so many people in his class ended up joining the military. Uh, the university almost shut down. And so the class of 1945 was redesignated the class of 45W for war. Hmm. And I think they actually graduated in 1947. Uh, and I have a picture that I love of him uh, in 1946 or so. He was the co-captain of the Yale baseball team uh, with George Bush, the elder. Hmm. Uh, the two of them were the captains. And uh, uh, in this picture of the team in 1946, they don't look like a college baseball team. They're all sunken-eyed, gaunt, bearded <laughs> combat veterans from Europe and the Pacific. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a funny photo, and it tells a lot about what they had all just been through. And, and his ship was attacked, and then uh, 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 little medallions were made. So, yeah, the ship was attacked and, uh, um, by a Japanese plane, and uh, the crew of the ship made little horseshoe medallions out of the metal of the wreckage of the plane and inscribed them with the date and place where the, uh, where the attack had happened. It was off of Okinawa on June 7th of 45, and gave them out as souvenirs to the crew. And when I joined the Marines and was getting ready to deploy overseas, my grandmother uh, gave the, the medallion to me and I wore it around my neck while I was gone. Mm -hmm. So it meant a lot to me. So, so uh, enlisting and, and you joined the volunteer army, was that an idea that came uh, from this background? Was it an idea in your head or was it really a product of your education? You were at Dartmouth mm. and graduated from Dartmouth. It's hard now for me to unpack what took me there. I think there were probably a bunch of different strands. One was uh, my parents, as I, as I mentioned. Another was studying classics in college and uh, reading about the concept of the citizen soldier and uh, to be a full citizen in, in the ancient world usually required you to have taken up arms at some point early in your adulthood. Uh, and uh, I was planning on going to medical school. That was my intent early in college. And I realized about midway through that I just wasn't interested in the natural sciences. And um, so I started looking at other options. And the Marines have a program 
where you can go to Officer Candidate School, which is the training program, kind of boot camp for officers for uh, a summer during your junior and senior year. So I did that, and then uh, I was committed. I, I enjoyed it, um, and so I was commissioned when I graduated. And it's important to note, you joined up uh, to the peacetime uh, 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 Marine Corps. Uh, you enlisted in, in, in what year? I joined uh, in 1998, mm -hmm. and I, I did most of the paperwork then in 1997. So um, if we think back to that time, uh, Bill Clinton was in the White House. Uh, serious people were talking about the end of history. Um, we were cashing in the so-called peace dividend mm -hmm. after the end of the Cold War. Military budgets were on the decline. Um, the, my, my generation of, of Marine officers, we were chomping at the bit, hoping against hope, really. Uh, we thought that we would get to do something operational after all the training we'd been through. Uh, and 9-11 at that point was still years in the future. So let, let's talk about being a Marine. What, 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 are, what are the skills required and uh, how does the Marine Corps incul uh, inculcate them mm -hmm. uh, into somebody who has a degree from Bar uh, D Dartmouth and, and majored in the classics? So I think that the, you can break it into two categories maybe. You have the technical skills. The, and I was an inf infantry officer, so the, the technical skills of being an infantry officer haven't changed very much since World War II. Um, it's the shooting and, and maneuvering a unit and communicating. Um, but more important than that, I think, is the ethos. You have a, uh, a very strong sense of being part of a team, of being um, unified in, in working together and, and trying to accomplish a mission. And that's really what the Marine Corps does. Uh, I think the, the technical training is, is good, but not better than it is in many militaries in the world, not better than it is in other parts of the U.S. military. Uh, but it's that, that inculcation of the ethos, that um, training to be a Marine and feeling like you're part of this elite group, that's, that's where the Corps really excels. And in, in combat, I think that's what carries the day. And, and I get the sense in, in reading your uh, uh, fascinating book that, that uh, some of this is, is very common sense skills uh, or virtues, virtues is a better word, that, that some, maybe our society is no longer inculcating mm. patience, persistence, uh, uh, focus on a, on a mission, and so on. Yeah, I think so. And uh, I, I've been amazed since leaving the Marines and uh, going to graduate school and now running a business at how rare some of the fundamental leadership qualities are that I thought mm -hmm. in the Marines were, were everywhere. Uh, the idea of just leading by example um, of, of uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, you can usually tell the leader because the, le the leader is, is awake earlier than everybody else, is, is going to sleep later than everybody else, is carrying more weight than everybody else. It's not, uh, it's not like the leader comes, you know, waltzing in and, and is being served by the, the people in, in his or her unit. It's the other way around. It's more of a, of a servant leadership kind of model um, where you have to follow before you can lead and you have to put your people ahead of yourself. And uh, in, in my experience, that'll take you a long way. And I think in the book that you talk about uh, moral leadership as opposed to uh, uh, leadership uh, by the rules, so to speak. Talk a little about that because uh, as, a, as an officer uh, leading a platoon in, in both Afghanistan and Iraq, you, you are constantly having to earn the respect of your men so that they will in fact follow you. There are two kinds of leadership in, in my experience. You have the legal authority. Uh, the legal authority is what you wear on your collar in the military. It's your rank insignia. And as a young lieutenant even, as a very junior officer, uh, that legal authority will get you a long way. Um, you know, it'll get you 15 minutes in a conversation, maybe. Mm -hmm. It'll get you about 10 seconds in a firefight. And, and what really matters, though, is moral authority. And your moral authority has nothing to do with, with your rank. It's the stature that accrues to people who, in my experience, do a couple of things. Uh, first, they are technically and tactically proficient. That is, they know their job, and they're good at their job. And two, uh, they genuinely care for the welfare of the people in their charge. And uh, the, the Marine officers I saw, not just officers, the Marines I saw, 
who did those two things well uh, accrued a lot of moral authority. And I saw corporals, young enlisted Marines, with the moral authority of colonels. And unfortunately, I saw colonels uh, with the moral authority of corporals. The, the legal and moral authority are not necessarily correlated. Is it fair to say that uh, a leader uh, such as you were has to have really political skills we're talking about? I, I, don't, I don't mean that as a pejorative. Mm -hmm. I mean that as somebody who's listening, is to their, uh, listening to his men, feeling their concerns, helping to guide those concerns so that they can then focus again on the mission? Yeah, uh, political, if, if what you mean by political is interpersonal, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I think that's important. It's, uh, if you're a, if you're a um, reclusive, uh, completely introverted person, I think it's going to be hard to, uh, hard to motivate people in, in that kind of setting. You have to be able to read people, I think, well enough to understand what motivates each of them and what they respond to. So some people respond well to a challenge. Others need to be bucked up and given positive feedback. Uh, some just need to be criticized. Others don't want to talk. They just will follow your example. So I, I think you, it, it helps if you can kind of suss out um, how each person sees the world. Now, what, what in the Marine Corps, what separ separates an officer from his men? Is it that you've acquired these skills uh, uh, to a more advanced degree? Is it the education you bring to the Marine Corps? Uh, who become the mm -hmm. leaders? Who remain the followers? Well, in, in the Marines, I wouldn't draw the distinction between officers and enlisted as between leaders and followers. Um, the, the simple distinction is that officers have at least a bachelor's degree and most many, most of the enlisted Marines don't. So mm -hmm. typically if you graduate from high school and enlist, you are then an enlisted Marine. If you graduate from college, you're commissioned as an officer and, and that's the track you're on. But uh, there are non-commissioned officers, so enlisted Marines who after three or four years um, have risen far enough through the ranks that they, they become corporals, NCOs, and the NCOs, uh, the corporals, the sergeants, the staff sergeants and gunnery sergeants and so on, uh, they're really the, the backbones of the Corps. They are the day-to-day, -day kind of block-by-block -block leadership uh, in, a, in a small Marine unit. Uh, and so I would say that their leadership, even though they're not technically commissioned officers, is every bit as important to the functioning of a Marine unit. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as the nature of war changes, it, it seems that the skill set becomes more and more complex. Uh, it's not as if you're fighting World War II like battles. We're going to talk more about how warfare has changed, but I'm just curious, how is this, in your view, changing the skill set that has to be developed and is developed? It's getting a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. And unlike many organizations uh, that, that have the luxury of choosing their mission, the military doesn't. So just because warfare evolves and, and a new set of responsibilities is added to the military's um, list of, of tasks at which it has to excel, it doesn't mean that something else is taken away. So it's additive. And uh, um, young officers today, I think, have to be proficient in a wider range of skills than even my generation had to 10 or 12 or 15 years ago. Um, it is getting more complex, and, and it is evolving, and we need to adapt, and yet we need to retain those core capabilities too. So, yeah, I, I agree. It's unlikely uh, that we're going to see uh, some sort of conventional World War II style fighting, uh, and yet it's a real risk if we choose to get rid of that capability, and so I think we would be wise and, and well advised to retain it. Uh, but we also have to do the counterinsurgency uh, sort of, of um, training and understand how to accomplish those missions as well. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at, at its core, a military mission is about fighting and uh, shooting and being shot, you know, taking territory. You start with that, but these other skills in this new kind of nation-building mode uh, are much more relating to people, 
uh, uh, seeing their concerns and so on. Uh, it's, if you think about that decision-making process, that must be pretty complex for the, for the soldier on the ground to uh, uh, incorporate, you know, both modalities. Yeah, uh, counterinsurgency warfare, wars like are being fought right now in Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. are, are governed by a series of paradoxes, it seems. So the idea that uh, often the more you shoot, the less effective you are. The more of the enemy you kill, the worse off you are. Mm -hmm. The more you protect your own forces, the less likely you are to win. These are all counterintuitive ideas. And so it requires a certain mental flexibility and trust on the part of young officers who are being asked to uh, expose themselves and their units to much greater risk. Uh, and they, they almost have to bear that risk on faith that, uh, that in the end it is going to make it more likely uh, that they're going to accomplish the mission that they're there trying to achieve. And, and Ed, you, I think you used a phrase in, in your talk yesterday that, that uh, the decisions that a corporal uh, uh, or a soldier on the ground makes can have uh, really strategic implications for the mission. Talk about that because mm -hmm. that's very important. So th there's a real burden of responsibility on the Marine with a gun entering a village focused on protecting him and his, his fellow soldiers uh, but also concerned about winning the village. So this is an idea that was uh, kind of codified in the Marines in the 1990s and given the name the strategic corporal. So the idea that the combination of the 24-hour news cycle, the media's all-seeing eye, the camera's ability to beam events back into living rooms around the world in real time, uh, that phenomenon coupled with the increasing lethality of firepower that's available to very junior people. Uh, you, you, you lay those on one another and you have strategic corporals. You have young um, Marines and soldiers and junior officers who have the ability to make decisions that have strate strategic or inter international repercussions in a way that a private or a corporal, say, in Napoleon's army couldn't, even in a way that a private in World War II couldn't or even Vietnam. Uh, so this is a trend that, that I think is likely only to accelerate, and it, it means that decision-making with strategic repercussions is increasingly pushed down onto the shoulders of very junior people, and so it makes it all the more important that those very junior people understand what it is we're trying to do and uh, that we don't make it less likely that we're going to win the war simply to, to win any particular battle. And And... It, it, at the core of this also seems to be that, you know, when we think of the military, we think of patriotism, we think of the people at home waving flags, and, and so there is fairly or unfairly a notion that you give yourself o over to your own tribe, your own nation, whatever. But at the core now of this new world we're talking about, you really do have to think of the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just struck with how complex that mission is, uh, thinking about the self and the other simultaneously or at one point in time thinking about the self and, and, but at another time thinking about the other. Yeah, I, I guess I think of it, I usually think of it in terms of national interest yeah. uh, and, and what the interests of the United States are and I, I think it requires a, a few bedrock philosophical beliefs and if you don't share them you're probably not going to be satisfied in the military. One is, you know, I, I do believe that um, through history the U.S. has generally been a force for good. Um, I, think a, a, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill famously said that the U.S. Um, always does the right thing after exhausting all the other alternatives first. Um, and so without being too jingoistic about it, I, I think that the U.S. generally is a force for stability and prosperity and self-determination in the world. Um, and so it, advancing our interests, safeguarding the stability of the system, um, it does require that balance between what our interests are and, and, and what, and, and as you say, the consideration of the other. Um, 
and you look at a place like Afghanistan, the, the exit ticket for the United States from Afghanistan is not uh, killing or capturing all of the Taliban. This is mm -hmm. impossible. The, they're infinite in number because people are attracted to the ideology. And uh, the exit ticket, again, is not uh, developing infrastructure. If we turned Kabul into, into Manhattan and built a, built a road network and electrical grid and, and everything else to rival anything in the United States, uh, it's still it's still not going to make the difference in my opinion uh, what matters is is building the capacity of Afghans to do these things for themselves and until uh, we are able to build that capacity in the Afghan security forces and in the government uh, it doesn't mean we can't leave it just means that when we leave we are going to be assuming um, a much higher degree of risk and we have to be we just have to understand that I think and make that decision in a clear-eyed way mm -hmm. You, at, at one point in your book, you talk about how marine training uh, prepares you uh, to essentially uh, have uh, a picture, a perspective that is broader than your own self-survival. Uh, I, I, I recall at one point you, you say uh, you would just as soon go to sleep as opposed to go after the Iraqi gun. I'm, I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. here and so on. Talk a little about that because it, it, it's a way to make sense mm -hmm. of the military ritual, the military training, uh, and, and so on, because it's really about having you, the soldier, the individual soldier, rise above, uh, uh, rise above yourself in a way. It's, um, it is a striking thing that happens, and uh, you know, in many ways now, for me, I mean, it does, it seems like a different lifetime. Um, but you mentally have to cope or, un, or reconcile yourself to the, to the danger of the job and, and get over that. And so I saw people fall back on a few different coping strategies, if you will. Um, some said, I'm Superman and nothing can touch me. Um, and then you see a couple of people get killed and that, um, that, lie begins to be exposed uh, and others took a, almost a religious view and said my fate is in God's hands um, but but those two I think were a minority uh, and the vast majority in, in my anecdotal experience had sort of a dead man walking attitude a, a kind of an idea that oh hey we're in a we're in a very dangerous place um, the difference between life and death is seconds and millimeters I can't affect that, so I'm just going to do my job as best I can. And it sounds kind of morbid, um, but it's also liberating. And it, it, I think that getting there psychologically is what ultimately frees you to, to do your job. Uh, and, and as you say, to kind of rise above yourself. And um, not in some heroic way, just in a very kind of work-a-day way, not worry about your own safety anymore, but instead focus on the people around you and, and what it is you, that you're trying to do. Uh, as a as an officer of a platoon, I got the sense that that you were wearing at, at one moment in time many hats. You were concerned about your men uh, and and getting them through what they're going through. Uh, on the other, so so looking at them, looking at them as as they surround you, and the fact that they're dependent on you as their leader. But then looking up uh, uh, to your superiors who are giving you uh, uh, the tasks that are required by the mi mission, you are sort of sometimes caught in a crossfire where you see the contradictions in those two roles. Talk a little about mm -hmm. that because it's a, it, you, you obviously had to develop survival mechanisms, not just for the bullets mm -hmm. that were coming at you, but, but these very different uh, pressures that were upon you. Junior officers are, are in a very interesting position, uh, the, the lieutenants and the captains by and large, because they are senior enough that they have a little bit more visibility. They, they see more of what's going on. The blinders that are on their eyes are, are a little bit wider. Um, but they're junior enough that they're still sleeping alongside the men, fighting alongside the men, carrying rifles along with the men. And so there are bridges, in a way, between these two worlds, the more rarefied world of the commanders and the 
and the, the pieces moving on maps. And then the kind of bloody, dirty world where the war is being fought. And the junior officers are the link between the two, and so they have to function um, in, in both. And loyalty runs up and down the chain of command. You, I, I felt very strongly that I had a duty and an obligation to give my commander options, not to tell him what I couldn't do, uh, but to tell him what I could do and to find a way to accomplish what he needed me to accomplish. But at the same time, uh, I had a sacred obligation not to spend the lives of my Marines cheaply. Uh, we were all willing to put ourselves at great risk, but let's do it for a good reason, not for some lark or some ill-considered mission. And so uh, it's a balancing act. And, and I was taught in my training in the peacetime 1990s that we had two competing, not competing, but, but two equivalent obligations, one to accomplish our missions and the other to take care of our troops. And in combat, my experience was that they don't, they can't be equivalents. You can't do both. At any given point, you're making a point decision that's prioritizing one over the other. You're prioritizing mission over men or men over mission. And if it's always mission first, then pretty soon you're mm -hmm. going to be standing there by yourself because everyone else is either mm -hmm. dead or has decided you're a lunatic. And if you always prioritize the men over the mission, then you might as well stay at home and play basketball. So you have to strike a balance there. Uh, there's no formula for it. Um, I didn't get it right all the time. Uh, but, but you try to get it right more than wrong. And I think that's the, the fundamental challenge for junior officers particularly, is striking that balance between mission and men. And, and in, the, in, the, in your book, and I should show the book, and we will show it again, One Bullet Away, it, it's quite a, quite a read, and, and you've done a wonderful job there in capturing all of these tensions and so on. And, and looking at the, the mission side of this, uh, uh, you, you write, I was still conditioned to accept senior officers' decision regardless of their stupidity, criminality, or in humanity, and, and I'm just reading this because it really shows the frustration, mm -hmm. you know, that you could be feeling at a, at a particular uh, uh, point. Those cracks in my trust were getting wider, growing into chasms, filling with fear and rage, sorrow and regret. I felt impo impotent, but I, was, I wasn't powerless. I had an assault rifle in my hands, and I won't, you know, and then you go on to say, you know, you, 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 there are thoughts in your mind that you're yeah. so uh, strong are your feelings for your men under you, uh, but but you sort of you hold back and 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 you come to live with that tension. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, I mean, you're you know in, in a way it's surprising that uh, in such an emotionally charged atmosphere, you know where where everybody's carrying a gun, uh, it's almost like a you know it's mutual assured destruction. There's <laughs> there's kind of an uneasy detente. It's like uh, you know it's like being in a saloon and. New Mexico in 1895, you know, everybody has a six shooter on their hip and so you kind of eye one another carefully. Um, but I, I did feel that way at times and, um, and it's, uh, you know, the most powerful emotion I've ever felt in my life because you're, you're literally trading in human lives. And um, again, you, you just have to find a way to square the circle and, and find a way to, to strike a balance and if you can't, um, then you get fired or you get relieved or, you know, maybe you get fragged by your own men. You just have to find a way to, 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 to balance and, and achieve the mission, respect the seniority of your commanders and take care of your people. Um, and in my experience, you know, the vast, vast majority of the guys I serve with were able to do that. You're, you're, there's a perception outside the military that it's all saluting and yes sir, no sir, and, and goose stepping around doing what you're told. I think it's much more nuanced than that. And you have people who are, who are making tough decisions um, with, within, and, and they have a lot of room to compromise. Uh, now looking to the, the men who are under you and around you uh, and, and dealing with the other side of the equation, you have an interesting discussion of of storytelling, that uh, part of your role is to, uh, after a mission, to to uh, to sit and talk with them, let their air their feelings, 
you, you make a very fascinating point that people have very uh, different uh, pictures, stories of what actually you all just went through. Mm -hmm. Even you, you're, you're not sure sometimes of your own senses about things. But talk a little about that because that's, that's how you, you implement the, the other side of this very complex role is listening to your men, uh, talking with them about what went wrong and, and thinking about how you can improve the, the teamwork in the future. One of the things the military does very well as an institution is debrief. Uh, and, and that means taking a pause after an operation and uh, hashing out what happened, figuring out what went right, what went wrong, and then learning from it. And I, th I think that most organizations benefit from, from that and few organizations do enough of it. Uh, but the military does a lot of it. It's ingrained in the culture. And uh, um, it is one of the hats that you wear as a junior officer, sometimes your big brother, sometimes your, you know, mayor, your disciplinarian, your whatever, but you're also coach. And so this is sort of the chalk time where you get around the chalkboard and you say, okay, you know, here's what I saw, what did you see? And um, it is stunning sometimes to realize how little what you remember, uh, how different it is from what other people remember. And there were times, a few times, when we, we had we could see the objective reality and we could measure our subjective interpretations against the objective reality. Uh, and, and in one case in particular, I remember um, we were in a firefight in a town and uh, driving at the time. It was kind of a running gunfight where we were in vehicles and the guys we were fighting were in buildings. And um, I remembered a certain layout of the town. I remembered uh, a turn over a river and where a building was located and I had a very clear memory of what it was that we had just done and then afterward I looked at a satellite picture of where we'd been and the reality hmm. uh, and what I remembered were almost unreconcilable. I, they, they were so different and so the, the lesson I took from that was you know, if you put eight people in a room in a gunfight uh, you're gonna get eight different stories afterward and everyone can be telling the truth. Uh, another important role that you have is, is in a way, you are the, the, the ethics man uh, on, on the mission. And uh, or maybe a better way to say this is you were very conscious of uh, the rules of war and the rules of war and what a just war is and how you implement a just war and so on. So I want to talk a little about that because you, you are presented with ethical dilemmas embedded in this crossfire between the people around you and, you know, the people who are giving you orders. And, and that was something you dealt with, and, but, but you bore the burden of that. Talk a little about that. There is a case where... Uh, as I recall, and it, it's a complicated book, so I can't remember the mm. name of every village or every bridge, mm. but uh, in which uh, the rules of engagement were suspended because the, it was believed by your superiors that this was a, 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 a very dangerous situation, which meant that your men were, were firing and then some innocents were wounded. Talk a little about that and, mm -hmm. and both what, what led you to, to act in the way you did, but also the moral dilemma it mm -hmm. presented to you after the fact. Yeah, I, I think that as a unit leader at any level, um, you have to be the moral compass to some extent, and, uh, and people will follow the example you set. You can establish a command climate that is either tolerant of civilian casualties or intolerant of civilian casualties because there's no clear line. It's, it's shades of gray. And so you can influence where the line is uh, in people's perception. And so um, in the case that you're referring to, um, we had been operating under kind of standard rules of engagement that say that uh, you, can, you can only return fire. You, or you, you can initiate if you're presented with a clear and present danger, but generally speaking, in, in a, in a, on a battlefield where civilians are everywhere, you can return, but generally not initiate. The bar to initiate is much higher. And so 
uh, we were ordered to seize an airfield, and uh, an Iraqi military airfield. And uh, there were reports that there were tanks on this airfield and other heavy equipment with a lot of firepower. And the order came over the radio that the rules of engagement had changed, and this was being declared a free fire area that, that everybody was declared hostile, and if we saw anybody on the airfield, we could shoot first. And I got this order over the radio as we were literally driving 60 miles an hour down the access road of this airfield ready to crash through the fence. This is in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought for a second, you know, the, the order about the change in, in rules came over one radio frequency and I had to pass it on to my to my uh, my Marines on another frequency and I hesitated for a second and debated whether to pass it on because it just didn't sound right to me. Um, but I did pass it on and I assumed that um, somebody above me in the chain of command had a good reason for, for making the change. And I didn't want my first indication that this airfield really was garrisoned with Iraqi troops to be, you know, my lead vehicle blowing up in a ball of fire and then I'm confronting the deaths of five or six Marines because I failed to pass on uh, an order. And so I, I passed it on. And uh, there was a little shooting and uh, a couple hours later when we had secured the the airfield, um, uh, a, f a few women approached our position dragging two wounded boys with them, um, young boys who were, I don't know how old they were, 10 or, or 12. And uh, one had been shot in the leg and the other shot in the abdomen. And, you know, we had done it. Uh, and so we immediately had to go to work treating these boys and trying to get them medevaced to, to good care. Um, but it had a, it had a, Profound psychological impact on the on the Marines. It was something that stuck with them. And and it, you you incorporate that. You learn from that. But you have to go on, right? I mean, you can't. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you, can't, yeah. you can't raise your hand and, and say and, I but, quit. And there was resistance by your superiors to to having them flown away. That is, the young boys yeah. to be treated and so on. Yeah. Uh, there were there was a very bad weather at the time, and so there weren't a lot of helicopters flying, and there were. Americans being killed and wounded and so they said hey the priority goes to goes to us we're, we're not going to take care of these boys and I said look you know this you don't understand it's not only about the boys this is about us if if you fail to evacuate these boys you're psychologically damaging a whole whole group of Marines and compromising uh, their ability to fight again tomorrow they have to believe in the system they have to believe that if we screw up we're going to be accountable um, and we're going to do our best to, to make it right and if you look the other way and ignore it, then, uh, then, then believe me, you are hurting us. You're hurting our ability to fight. And that argument eventually prevailed, and we were able to evacuate the boys. And you, you say that, that you saw it as your job to really, uh, to, in the realm that you controlled, really to impose as much of an ethical order as possible. I'm paraphrasing you now. That Yeah, I mean, I try. I don't think I did it to any greater extent than most of the people around me. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think it's important for a few reasons. One, it's important to our, uh, it's important to our mission. Um, if, if we are seen as, um, we can't compromise our ideals in the course of claiming to defend them. And uh, uh, so I, I, I think that's important from a military mission standpoint. I think it's also a, a moral obligation um, that all of us have. And I think that it, it also is uh, uh, a duty, uh, you have a duty as a leader to ensure that the people you're leading are going to be able to look themselves in the mirror for the rest of their lives and, and trust that they had done the right thing. That, and, and I don't mean at a strategic level, I don't mean the decision to go to war in Iraq or any, any of that other stuff that we couldn't affect, but how we could affect our one little slice. Um, I couldn't put, I felt that I couldn't put my Marines in a, in a morally untenable position where they were choosing between evil and evil. You know, they, they had to be able to uh, find a way through that was going to leave them psychologically intact. And, and you, you define that as a central uh, goal of your position, namely to, it's not just that these soldiers under you have to survive physically, uh, 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 but also that they, in a way, have to survive psychologically and morally because mm -hmm. they, they have to come back and, and live with what they've done and be integrated into the society. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's just as important. Um, 
a psychological trauma or, or, or um, you know, th those wounds can be as compromising, they can be as debilitating as, uh, as losing a limb. You, you quote, uh, interestingly enough, for, uh, uh, from St. Augustine uh, somewhere in the book uh, as, a, as a prologue to one of the sections, uh, and uh, I want to read this quote to lead into this whole problem of strategy versus tactics. Uh, you say, anyone, uh, St. Augustine says, anyone who looks with anguish on evil so great must acknowledge the tragedy of it all. And if anyone experiences them without anguish, his condition is even more tragic since he remains serene by losing his humanity. Uh, that's quite a, hmm. quite a passage. And uh, I, I was struck in your book, and, and we should explain to our audience, they're all going to go out and buy it, <laughs> that, that uh, you were involved in the uh, original uh, attacks mission in Afghanistan and then mm -hmm. uh, in the initial phase of, of the Iraq war. And uh, there is a, in Af Afghanistan a, a very important turning point, which you describe very well. Your, your soldiers are positioned to uh, go into Tora Bora, uh, where uh, it is believed that Osama bin Laden and Dr. Zawahiri uh, have escaped uh, after the American attack and, and the attack by the Northern Alliance. Uh, and you, you describe the fee, your feelings and the feeling of your men, and, and uh, you're, you're bursting with the, the desire to revenge the 9-11 attacks, as was the United States. Now, when I read this passage, mm -hmm. I found it fascinating because one of the, the theories about the leadership in Washington propounded by Stephen Holmes of, of NYU in a book, that, uh, The Matador's Cape, is that this may have been the feeling of our leaders uh, in Washington also when they, when they chose to, uh, to uh, strike out uh, uh, against Iraq. Mm -hmm. but, but the irony here is there is a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I want you to, I mean, it, it was so extraordinary when I have read these two accounts, the extent to which you soldiers on the ground who had been trained were ready to go, you know, no matter what the cost uh, on the one hand. But back home, uh, leaders who may have had the same feeling about striking back mm -hmm. chose to go to Iraq. So I guess I'm asking you to comment on that because what, what is very clear is that there is sometimes, uh, maybe more times than we would like, a disconnect between what we're able to do and the tactics, but the, the, uh, the leadership at home who have the wrong strategic goals. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it reminds me of a, you know, there's a scene in, in an old Western um, where uh, uh, someone leads the sheriff to a guy on the street and says, that's the person who stole my horse, and the sheriff draws his gun and shoots the guy standing next to him. And it's <laughs> sort of, you know, that's how I felt during that year. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, we, you know, there we were, ready to go to Tora Bora, where we had good intelligence that this is where the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks were at that time during the weeks before Christmas of 2001. Um, and we didn't go. And then a year later, we're off to Iraq. And so, uh, um, you know, I confess that I didn't really understand why. Um, but at the same time, in a all-volunteer force in a constitutional democracy, we swear an oath, and that oath is to obey the lawful orders of a democratically elected government. It's, we, we don't want the guys with the guns making these decisions. We want them executing the decisions that are made by accountable civilian political leaders. So I, I believe in that sac sacrosanct principle. Uh, but, but there was clearly a disconnect, and I think there still is something of a disconnect between strategy and tactics. We will uh, tactically prevail. When the United States does not win a small unit engagement, it's on the front page of the newspaper because it's so rare. Uh, there was a, an outpost overrun in Afghanistan in, in the summer of 2008, and I think 11 Americans were killed. And it was big news and the subject of a major investigation that lasted several years. Uh, because this is exceedingly rare. We win at the tactical level. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we can have all the tact tactical victories in the world, but it, it, it doesn't guarantee um, strategic victory. And so 
I, I think we need to have a serious conversation in this country about what it is we're trying to do. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Nietzsche, who says that the commonest form of human stupidity is forgetting what it is we're trying to do. So <laughs> we, can, we can win every, every little fight in Afghanistan and every little fight in Iraq, but what is it that we're trying to do? What is the world uh, that we're hoping to have uh, 10 or 20 or 50 years from now? Uh, and so there is a major disconnect between strategy and tactics in this country right now. And, and uh, you now are, are the head of a, of a Washington think tank. And, and what, what uh, would you like to see or what do you feel is necessary mm. uh, for new kinds of linkages or rejuvenating old kinds where the, these insights sort of are brought into the strategy? Or, or is it really places like Dartmouth and Berkeley and Harvard where, where people are, are looking at the world in a, a broader context where the insights that will come that will tell us uh, what the strategy should be and to what extent is it the information that you're gathering uh, on the tactical level in your uh, role as a soldier or if there were diplomats there or whatever. I, I, th there is some sort of a disconnect, I'm asserting, I'm not saying you're saying this, between the learning processes uh, that are involved in the, uh, at the strategic level, you know, in the United States. We are not reflecting and learning in the way you are describing what's happening on the ground in war. I think we in the United States uh, often forget or, or fail to see how we are perceived abroad. And uh, we assume or, or um, presume that we are operating with good intentions and we mean no one any harm. And that's not the way it's seen by many. And uh, I think that a degree, of, uh, a degree of humility in our foreign policy is wise. Um, I think it's also strategically uh, beneficial to us because um, if we are too arrogant, if we are too forceful, uh, we provoke a backlash against us, a counterbalancing against us that has the net effect of uh, hastening our decline in relative power. And I, I'm interested personally in sustaining our power. Uh, but sustaining our power doesn't mean going forth and killing all the dragons. It, it means marshalling all of the resources of this country the cultural resources, the economic resources, the diplomatic resources, and the military resources, but not primarily the military resources, to, uh, to preserve a system that has been, on my, in my view, on balance, positive for most of the world for a very long time. And uh, unfortunately, it isn't human nature to have a system of equivalent number twos. Somebody's going to be number one. And I don't look at the world right now and see uh, a potential number one that is more benevolent uh, than the United States. Uh, I, I don't see it. And so I, I am interested in, in preserving uh, American power, but not the, not the mailed fist of American power, but a, but a, a softer power that has attractive, uh, um, that, that is attractive, that is more persuasive um, than it has been for the last decade, much of the last decade. Let's talk about how, if we followed what you just said, what, what that means about what the military should look like. One of the assumptions in the Iraq war was, by, by parts of our leadership, was that because of the revolutionary uh, changes in technology, uh, that uh, the, the revolution in military affairs uh, would uh, lead to a quick victory, uh, which uh, in a way, uh, by as its major assumption, really ignores some of the lessons of, of counterinsurgency and so on. So I'm, 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 I, w I want you to comment on the role of technology and how you integrate that from, from your experience into fighting a war successfully, but on the other hand, not alienating uh, uh, everything around you so that you can actually 
uh, leave the place uh, uh, more secure than it was. The, the, of course, the classic example now is the Obama administration is relying very heavily on drones mm -hmm. with a, a pinpointed mission of taking out uh, the terrorist leadership, but on the other hand, killing innocent people mm -hmm. in increasing numbers. Yeah, I, I've, um, I've gone back and forth, actually, on the drone question in particular, and I co-authored a piece uh, last year that was fairly critical of the use of drones, saying that, look, this is a tactic substituting for a strategy. It's a successful tactic, but the blowback, the strategic blowback, is exceeding the tactical benefit. Yeah, we're killing some terrorist leaders, but we're also provoking an enormous popular backlash against us in Pakistan that is ultimately going to undermine exactly what it is we're trying to do. Um, that said, now it, it seems, I would posit that uh, maybe the Obama administration is closer to right on this than I had given them credit for. Uh, I think there's a compelling argument that when you kill the number one leader and the number two steps up, okay, that's not worth a lot of civilian casualties, but when you kill numbers three, four, five, six, and so on down the line, and now number 25 is stepping up, you're talking about a real degradation in the capability of your enemy. Uh, and if, if you can trust polling in places like the tribal areas, uh, which I'm not sure we can, but, but it seems that uh, people in the northwest frontier, in Waziristan, are actually much more supportive of the drone attacks than we think, than we assume, uh, provided the targets are the foreigners, not, not Pakistanis, but, the, but mainly Arabs who are living there among them. Uh, but using that just as maybe a springboard to the broader question about technology, uh, the, the gap between the United States and all of our possible competitors is widening technologically. And um, an interesting debate is going on right now in the Air Force over whether the next bomber uh, will be a manned aircraft or an unmanned aircraft. My suspicion is that it will be an unmanned aircraft. And, I'll hypothesize here in a way that's not going to make me po uh, very popular with, uh, with military aviators that the last American fighter pilot has already been born. Hmm. And uh, we're going to see an increasing movement towards robotics in warfare, uh, just as we do in, in, in surgery and in manufacturing and in so many other areas. Uh, and that's a double-edged sword. Uh, obviously, it has the huge benefit of helping keep uh, young people out of harm's way, but it changes the dynamic of warfare. It changes the way our adversaries think. Look at uh, much of the criticism of the drone strikes uh, in Pakistan. It, it is that they are not honorable, that, that they are uh, machine against man, that, that we don't have the honor to look someone in the eye and fight uh, person to person. And so you know, that's, that's an interesting, complicating factor that I do not think has been fully thought through, that's going to be increasingly important and is something that we're going to have to spend more time thinking about. Uh, another question is when you read this book, you, you can see the level of, of uh, tension. Uh, tension's not the word. I'm looking for a word that, that war, uh, the, the level of tension, of stress, of of hyperactivity of warfare and sort of how does one come down when the war is over? And, and I, I, I'm asking this as a lead into a question about the way we re treat our returning veterans. We just had uh, James Wright, the former president mm -hmm. of Dartmouth on, and he's, he's uh, developed uh, an innovative program to deal with that. Uh, do you see that we should be doing even more, and is there anything from your particular experience that, that you would like to see? I think President Wright uh, at Dartmouth pioneered a program that is, should be an example to everyone in this country. Uh, uh, of when, when he was president of the university, he visited uh, wounded soldiers and Marines at the military hospitals and encouraged them to pursue higher education. Uh, and then he put his money where his mouth was and, and offered scholarships for many of them to attend Dartmouth. And so uh, there are maybe 10 or 12 uh, Iraq and Afghanistan vets, many of them grievously wounded, who are now in school in, uh, in, in New Hampshire at Dartmouth. Uh, I think that we, the question about how you come down from the stress, you know, I'm not sure you do. Uh, 
or at least not wholly, not for a very long time. Uh, I'm not convinced that I'm there yet. Um, mm -hmm. There's almost like a rewiring of your brain that happens, and uh, and so you become accustomed to a much much higher pace of activity. Um, it's frenetic, and um, and I think it does take a long time to to slow down again and kind of re-enter normal society. Um, but we we have an obligation, I believe, as a country to do that. We can't uh, fight our wars on the backs of volunteers um, and then leave them alone to suffer the consequences. Uh, if, if we deal with our problems as a country, primarily militarily, we're going to fail. And if we deal with our military problems, if we put our military problems squarely on the backs of the less than 1% of this country that's in the military and their families, then we will fail. These burdens have to be spread. Uh, they can be spread through taxation, perhaps. They can be spread through um, uh, in encouraging a broader, uh, uh, broader ways to, to bring people into the military. Uh, an issue here in Berkeley, I know whether there should be a recruiting center in Berkeley. Um, and I think the people who protest it have have the issue exactly wrong, exactly backwards. If if you're, uh, the, the question is not about the military militarizing a place like this, it's about a place like this bringing its perspective and its point of view into the military. And if the U.S. is going to go to war, we need to go to war as a country. And we have to go to war um, representing all of these points of view. And I think that doing so um, we'll make it less likely that we go to war, and it will make us more committed to winning when we do. Um, and those both strike me as worthy goals. I think we should fight very infrequently, and we should win when we do. Uh, I'm one final question, and uh, I guess I, I often ask what, how students should prepare for the future, but I think hmm. uh, I'd rather, which we can get to, but uh, I'm curious, what courses do you wish you had taken at Dartmouth mm -hmm. are, uh, uh, even if they weren't offered, you wish they had had, that would have helped you with this experience both as a writer and as a soldier. Uh, you know, and that's a, an entree to, to how you think people who are interested in the military should prepare for the future. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I wish I'd taken more literature courses. Um, <laughs> I, I was wrapped up in I mean, I was a classics major, so not exactly a pre-professional degree. Um, you know, I wasn't studying accounting um, or something that was really directly transferable. But um, uh, but I do think students sometimes get caught up in the in the job question. You know, what am I going to do? How can I best prepare myself for for a job? And I think that's the wrong question. I think it's how can I best prepare myself for life? How can I think about? Uh, problems in a in a in an interesting way, uh, and and a good way to do that I think is vicarious experience to learn from vicarious experience to learn from people who went before you people who made mistakes before you. Uh, studying history is is a useful way to do that, but I think also studying literature, uh, literature that kind of plums the depths of human emotion and and gets at some of the hardest questions about life and death and good and evil. Uh, and so I, I would have taken, I think, maybe a, an even more um, um, philosophical approach to things, and just trusted that if you if you work hard and you do well, you're you're going to be able to get a job. So uh, maybe spend a little more time thinking about the bigger questions. Well, on that note, uh, I want to Nathaniel. I want to thank you for being here and for coming to the campus to be the 2010 uh, Nimitz lecturer. Let me show uh, our audience your book again. Uh, it's, it's a great read and it, it really gives one a feel for the dilemmas and the, and the emotions of, of fighting a war. Thank, thank you. And thank you very much. Well, it's a again. pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.